Let's move on to the second class of solutions when it comes to self-supervised learning. And if you see in the title data efficient, perhaps you need to change it to be label efficient. You basically have zero labels, zero label data. And that's the idea of contrastive predictive coding. So contrastive learning is gonna be another paradigm to approach uh, self-supervised learning. And it's sort of similar and different from what we were doing with deep cluster. And you're gonna see the similarities later on. For now, you're gonna notice the differences. Don't worry about this figure. Don't worry about this other figure. Remind me to go back to them. I'm gonna use them to explain the math here. Whenever you have an image and you have the corresponding, uh, perhaps CNN, ResNet, what a CNN does is gonna take as input an image, which is perhaps 256 by 256 by three channels, and it's gonna output another image. The resolution is gonna go down. It's gonna be seven by seven because you are collapsing pixels together and uh, you're increasing the dimension. You can think of CNNs as if you are playing with a dough. You take your image and then you reshape it using some weighted operations. And the cool thing is that in this output image, every single pixel is going to correspond to a patch of your original image. This could be overlapped patch or overlapped patches, but each single pixel in the output is going to correspond to a patch of your input image. And as you can see, this is seven by seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the other dimension is also seven. You're going to have a set of overlapping patches corresponding to each one of these output vectors. And let's say i is in this direction and j is in the other direction. That's how it is increasing. I'm going to need this compass to help us. So in the end of the day, you have a set of image patches in your image space. i and j are the locations of the patch. You take a patch, you encode it, and actually, if you use a fully convolutional network, you need only one pass of your network, one pass of the image through the network. And then it's going to give you all of these Zs. You don't need to do it patchwise. The notation seems to suggest that it's doing it patchwise. It is the notation, but it's just a single pass of your entire image through your network, which is going to give you all of these Z vectors. So for each location, you are going to have a Z vector. Each one of them are going to be is going to be 4096 dimensional. You are going to put a masked convolutional neural network, and I'm going to tell you why, need, why you need the mask. And you're going to apply that on these features. And if you interpret i as time, you can, you're looking at the pixels above an, an i that you chose. Perhaps you pick this i, and then you're looking at the past, all of the pixels coming before. And remember, time is going from up to down. So this is the past, this is the future. You're interpreting one of your pixel dimensions as time. And you want it to be masked because you don't want to pay attention to the things in the future. You're looking at the things in the past. And that's going to give you this neural network here, which is going to turn a bunch of Zs into their corresponding Cs. So C is going to come out of another convolution. This one, this time it is masked convolution. It's always looking at the past. It's not allowed to look at the future. Why would you do that? Because given C, you want to predict the future. This is similar to autoregressive language models that we were doing. Given the previous tokens in a sentence, predict the next tokens or predict the future. And Z is actually the ground truth. It could be one of these. And perhaps it is K a step ahead. It doesn't have to be the next step. It could be K steps ahead that you're predicting, or it could be all of them. That's your prediction length. How do you adjust the model? This is I and J dependent. You have I here, J here. How do you model K? You're going to model it with different weights. So per each prediction length, perhaps you're predicting one step into the future, you're going to have W1. Two steps into the future, you're going to have W2. And this is the prediction of the model. And guess what? You want the prediction of of the model to match the ground truth. Now you have self-supervision signal. But again, there is a catch here. 
if you put mean squared error loss in these two, and remember, these are not 100 vectors, so you cannot do the tricks that you do with language. If you put mean squared error here, uh, your model is going to collapse throughout the training and finding a constant, and constant is a solution, and it's going to ignore your images altogether. It's not going to be a, a function of your images. These are just constant stuff, and if you put a classifier on top of a constant, that's going to give you uh, the same predictions as you would get with luck, as if you're flipping a coin, or you're not learning anything in your Z vectors. How can you change that? And at the same time, we really like the softmax type of losses because they are sort of generic. They can approximate multimodal distributions. You can say there is infinitely many possibilities here. This is a continuous signal. How about we discretize it somehow? Turn it into a multi-choice uh, problem. I'm going to give you a couple of options, including the correct one. And then among those options, you need to pick the correct one. You need to pick the correct answer. And that's the idea of contrastive predictive coding. You're going to have a loss. You give it a bunch of candidate solutions in addition to the correct answer. And then you want to adjust the predictions of your model. First of all, how do you get these candidate solutions? Perhaps you can get them from a different image or from multiple different images. Perhaps you can give it one of these Z's from the same image. So these are candidate solutions. They are all wrong. One of them is going to be correct. And then the task is to find the correct one. And this is the way that you're going to bring back your favorite uh, softmax function again. This is the ground truth, the prediction of the model. If you multiply them, that's going to give you the similarity between the two. This is also the similarity between the same things. And this is the similarity between the prediction of the model and a random guess or a random answer. And you want to, to increase the probability of the correct answer among those multiple choices. This is going to find the correct answer after a while. But then for this loss to work, you need to show it a lot of these negative examples. It is similar to intrinsic hard example mining. The more examples you have here, the higher is the chance that one of them is similar to the answer, and then your model is going to work harder to find the correct answer. And then you let it train. It is self-supervision. This is called noise contrastive estimation. You are contrasting the true answer to noise. All of these, up until this point that I explained, is from a previous paper by the same authors. What are the contributions here? Increase your model size, its depth and width. Do layer normalization. So these have to do with the architecture design. The other contribution is here we were predicting only in one direction. For images, there is no concept of a past or future. Perhaps not only predict the future or to the bottom, predict to the left, the right, and up, predict in all four directions. And write down your loss function. And there is going to be extensive data augmentation. So I guess I explained this figure, at least the gray portion of the figure. You're going to have 100% images, 0% of them is labeled. You take your image, featureize it. On top of that, you have this masked convnet, this red stuff here. And then using noise contrastive estimation, you are going to pre-train your model in a self-supervised fashion without any labels. Let's have a baseline. The baseline is you're going to have supervised training. It could be the case that 100% of ImageNet is labeled, or it could be that 1% of those images are labeled. And this has to do with this figure. This is percentage of labeled data. The less labels you have, supervised learning is going to give you the least performance. If you have all of your data, it's going to do the best. Now let's see what happens if you do pre-training some sort of fine tuning. There is going to be this evaluation metric. This is very famous these days, the linear classification. And all you do is that on top of your feature extractor, which is pre-trained, you fix that. On top of that, you put a linear function, which is going to output 1,000 numbers because you have 1,000 classes. And then you only fine tune the linear part. The other one is efficient classification, where you're allowed to fine tune 
this neural network, but then you are going to be working with less data. This type of paradigm is uh, for evaluation. You can't find it in speech a lot. If you do self-supervision in for a speech data, then this is the strategy to evaluate it. And on top of that, you're going to put a small neural network, which is going to output 100 classes, and then you're going to write down your cross entropy. The other one is transfer learning, where you take this feature uh, extraction function. On top of that, you are going to put your detection head or segmentation head, and then you're going to have a task-specific loss for that. And then you, pre you adjust these and perhaps fine-tune this. Let's compare this efficient classification and supervised training. The efficient classification is the blue curve here with very few label data. This is sort of semi-supervised learning now. You are getting the best performance. This is five times fewer labels compared to the same performance here. Okay, is everything clear? Okay, perfect.